Sandeep Vaslekar, a widely respected chronicler and observer of global conflicts for decades and author of a new book, A World Without War, says we are living in the most dangerous period since the inception of the Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago. Vaslekar, a veteran of track to diplomacy around the world, as well as president of the think tank Foresight Group, calls for a new social contract for the world even as artificial intelligence increasingly controls deadly weapons, including nuclear weapons. He warns that unless the international community addresses these new dangers immediately, there are clear prospects of sleepwalking into a catastrophic event. Sandeep Paslikar spoke to Mayang Shah report from Mumbai about the central themes of his book, A World Without War, the history, politics, and resolution of conflict. Sandeep Vaslekar. Let me start with a philosophical question. Is there a just war? I ask because there has been a tendency in the West to wage many wars in the name of human justice. What do you think? Well, the theory of just war is quite old. It has been... uh, Almost now more than a thousand years uh, that this theory of just war has been debated. And what does the theory say? The theory says that a war is just if it is uh, launched by a sovereign, not by a non-state actor. And if there is a good enough reason. Now, this whole issue of good enough reason is a very subjective issue. Uh, so, what is a what is a good reason which which justifies which justifies uh, uh, a war? The first condition of a war being launched by sovereign is 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 easily understood. Anyway, war is between the sovereign states most of the time. Uh, so that part is easier. I am not so sure there is anything like a just war. If especially the war is for the purpose of invasion, it cannot be just at all. Mm-hmm. But if it is a war for the purpose of defending yourself from an invasion, there could be an element of justice. But then it again depends on the background and who invoked the war and who caused the war. Right. So theoretically, you may be defending yourself from, a, from an invasion, but if you provoke the war, then... It is not a pure invasion. It is something of a either an adverent or inadvertent result of your own making. But if you haven't provoked the war and if you have been invaded, I believe that every sovereign state has a right to defend itself. And in that defense, a war is going to take place. And that is the only situation where I can see a war being just. Yes, but if you look at it from a different angle, every sovereign state thinks whenever they invoke a war, they think it's a just war, irrespective of what the reality is, don't you think? Yes, absolutely right. I mean, uh, every every state, uh, or in fact, for that matter, even a non-state actor, when they wage a war, they think it is just from their point of view. Exactly. Uh, but the question is whether a war is just or not, is not to be finally decided by the invader. It's going to be decided by history if a particular war was just. And so what are the parameters that you apply if you are uh, uh, looking back and analyzing a war? And there you have to be neutral. And you have to see if it was a pure invasion for aggrandization, uh, for a selfish purpose, for looting, for subjugation of another uh, people, or whether... It was really a war to defend an invasion. Right. See, the the wars have been launched with all kinds of excuses, and each excuse is offered as 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 uh, uh, just. In my book, A World Without War, which I have just come out with, I have given the example of uh, 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 Pope uh, 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 in 1095 who launched the first crusade, which was one of the biggest wars of history. And he said that uh, he had to launch that war in order to retrieve Jerusalem. But 
Jerusalem had been taken over by the uh, Muslims in the 7th century. So you justify a war in the 11th century in the name of something that happened in the 7th century. Similarly, in uh, the 1990s, when the Serbs launched an attack on Bosnia, they justified in the name of uh, something that had happened in 15th or 16th century when the Turks had humiliated the Serbs. And so they said that they were seeking justice for the humiliation that had happened 300 years ago. So if you if you just want to seek uh, justice, you can find something that has happened 300, 400, 500 years ago. And there is no end to that. Uh, so those who launch war will always find an excuse. Take another example. In the Fourth Crusade, the Fourth Crusade was meant to be started by the Holy Roman Empire. And it was uh, uh, the purpose was to retake Jerusalem, which was lost in the Second Crusade. Now, the Crusade never went up to Jerusalem. They went to Istanbul, which was a, a Christian, which was a part of Christendom. And uh, but it was a different branch of Christendom. It was a Greek Orthodox uh, branch of Christendom. And they looted uh, uh, Istanbul or what was called Constantinople at that time. They totally looted uh, Constantinople. On the way, they looted even some Roman Catholic states uh, with the help of the Doge of uh, Venice. And a branch of Fourth Crusade went to France. And uh, there they killed and maimed and raped uh, uh, a branch of Christianity which didn't believe in the uh, dominance of Catholicism. So uh, you say that you started the war in the name of uh, reconquering or regaining Jerusalem, but you are going only as far as Constantinople and you are uh, 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 tearing apart a city which belongs to Christendom. So where is justice in this? And if you examine every war that has taken place throughout history in any part of the world, I have given you examples of, from Europe, but uh, uh, but any part of the world, you would always find that the invader offers a justification. But what is that justification? Uh, 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 that is the question we must ask. Sure. Uh, you know, that brings me to another broader question. Uh, is there a sort of a statute of limitations, as it were, on... Uh, or even an expiry on feeling having been wronged historically. So you are exacting revenge, even if it is centuries down the line. Uh, that's how the human mind works. How do you work around that? Sorry, my anchor, I didn't hear you properly. Can you repeat, please? Yeah, I was saying uh, it, it brings it to a broader question about, uh, uh, you know, the whether there is a statute of limitation or a, an expiry date on human beings feeling wronged for centuries and exacting revenge, even if it is centuries down the line? Well, of course, there is no statute. There should be. <laughs> a, 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 but again, even if you even if you try to introduce a statute, the question will be, where do you draw the line? Do you draw the line 1,000 years ago? Because events uh, as far back as 500 or 600 years ago have been exploited to launch violence and wars. Or do you draw that line 10 years ago? Or do you draw that line five months ago? Or do you draw that line one week ago? So uh, I don't think there can be a statute as such. I think this is all an excuse of the war mongers. I think those those who want to wage a war, they wage a war. And right. then they find a reason. Right. And sometimes the reason is God. Sometimes the reason is revenge. Sometimes the reason is justice. But uh, it is just a reason. Right. One of the things I found and I have argued in my book, A World Without War, is that war is really a matter of choice. Right. War is not determined by any kind of a statistical pattern. It is also not determined by, by biological properties. It's not even so directly determined by sociological or economic uh, uh, factors, though they play a role. At the end of the day, war is a choice that some leaders make. And once that choice is made for whatever reason that suits the leaders who are making the choice, then those leaders find a reason. And those reasons can be uh, can be divine, they can be historical, they can be economic, uh, they can be social. But in the end, uh, it is all uh, sweetened as justice right. and, 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 and redressing injustice. 
uh, which has happened in the past. Right. What is the central conceit of your book? Uh, do you think a world without war is possible? Well, my argument is that, in fact, a major global war or a series of global wars are likely to happen in the in the near future. Uh, maybe in uh, five years or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. And whenever a really major global war takes place, and if weapons of final destruction are used, and these are not only the nuclear weapons and biological weapons and chemical weapons, but also the application of uh, cyber technology, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, and uh, uh, lethal autonomous uh, technologies. Uh, so if these weapons are used with these modern technologies where human beings have very little control, there is an extremely high risk that human civilization may perish. So we are looking at the risk of our own survival being at stake and our civilization being extinct in our lifetime in the next 10 to 20 years. And so we must make every possible effort to try to pull back from the precipice and to create a framework for global governance where there is no incentive for war and where disputes are resolved through diplomatic measures and where you create an institutional architecture which uh, makes it possible to, uh, uh, to resolve conflicts without engaging into a war, particularly a lethal, lethal war. Right. And so the book provides a menu of options, uh, solutions, uh, uh, remedies for the way forward. Uh, you have argued that uh, we are living in the most dangerous period since the inception of the Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago. That may seem to some like an over-the-top over view. Why do you say that? Well, I, I believe that this view is backed by hard facts. Let's start with some of the simple facts and then go on to a little more complex facts. In 1999, at the end of Cold War, the global military expenditure was uh, $1 trillion, or $1,000 billion. You would imagine that after the end of Cold War, the global military ex expenditure would decline. Instead, it has doubled. And this year, the global military expenditure is around $2 trillion. So the appetite for killing and for acquiring weapons and instruments of annihilation of uh, humanity has has increased to the extent that countries are willing to spend almost double of what they spent at the end of cold war we now have almost 10000 nuclear weapons uh, in military service of nine countries well somebody might argue that this is better than 66000 nuclear warheads which existed in 1980s but 10,000 is bad enough to destroy the uh, planet many times over. And while the numbers have, numbers have declined, the lethality of nuclear weapons has increased. There is also an effort being made to legitimize the use of nuclear weapons. One of the, the legacies that uh, Donald Trump uh, left as the president of the United States uh, 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 before he left the office in the elections, uh, that he introduced the concept of uh, low-yield nuclear weapons. So these are the weapons of the size of uh, the bomb that was uh, detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, about 15 kiloton. And, and he thinks that those low-yield low kind of weapons which don't destroy entire human civilization, they can be used. But this is an effort to, to legitimize. But, but what he didn't say and what the media doesn't say that many of these low yield weapons are earth penetrating weapons, which means their devastating capacity is 20 times of what the actual capacity is. So if a weapon is about 15 kiloton, actually it's uh, the devastating capacity is 300 kilotons. Right. And most of the weapons that now exist with big countries like US, Russia, China are more than 1000 kiloton. And with other countries like Israel, India, uh, Pakistan, North Korea are 100 kilotons. So uh, we have moved far from the days of Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. Right. 
another <laughs> development that's taking place is that biology is getting weaponized and there are many different ways in which is happening and there is a risk of uh, a deadly pathogen right. being born not only to spread the disease but even uh, pathogen that can absorb atmos uh, oxygen from the atmosphere and make our existence uh, impossible you have increasing use of artificial intelligence and yes. uh, uh, other autonomous techno technologies and techniques now with that the control of uh, military commanders and human beings on some of the most deadly weapons is being weakened and it is being handed over to algorithms and machines so uh, with all of this happening there is another development and that is your arms control regime is in tatters the inf has been abandoned the new start was barely renewed at the beginning of biden administration but we don't know if it will be renewed further and in any case the current new start treaty allows for 2800 weapons between russia and america to uh, be put on the high trigger alert uh, you have uh, uh, all other kinds of uh, open sky treaty and all other kinds of arms control treaties uh, 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 anti uh, uh, ballistic missile treaty they have all been renounced and so you don't really have a robust arms control regime anymore Right. there is no dialogue between the p5 members of the un security council since the ukraine war so there are clearly two camps with the western camp us uh, britain and france on one side and russia and china on the other side with no communication taking place earlier there was a dialogue mechanism especially on arms control and disarmament so that has broken down so with lethality of weapons increasing with 2800 nuclear warheads on alert with artificial intelligence moving in to take control from human beings with arms control regime uh, totally broken down we have a big risk of slip walking into a war a global nuclear war or maybe even a war that includes uh, uh, very deadly biological weapons uh, either by accident or inadvertently by an incident or by intent Right. even by intent that's also possible uh, and you... i'm not saying necessarily that this could happen tomorrow or the year after or the year after that but this could easily happen in 10 or 15 years because you don't know what kind of leaders will emerge right and with the forces of ultra nationalism gaining ground in many countries in the world you are likely to have more and more strident and more and more nationalist uh, uh, forces with very small and myopic vision of the world coming to power right. so we are really 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 looking at a chasm we are on the on the, uh, the brink of a, a, a big uh, mountain we may collapse we may fall down any time as a civilization and i don't think in the last 200000 years we ever faced a risk where the entire human civilization could be wiped out in 24 hours uh, do you fear that a stage may come when ai Uh, could become intuitive and even capricious along human lines and may cause the kind of catastrophe that you're talking about there is a big debate taking place about that in the ai community currently what we have is uh, narrow artificial intelligence now there is a debate whether this ai will move on to general artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence in 30 40 years from now and then whether it will move to super intelligence which is even higher than the artificial general intelligence and there are no clear answers so far which have emerged there are ai experts who believe that we may move on to artificial general intelligence in 100 years or 50 years or 40 years and some may say it may not happen at all but my fear is not the transformation of ai into general or super intelligence that even the ai that exists today and the way it is evol evolving today even within the parameters of narrow artificial intelligence there is a risk of ai being used in the management of weapons of mass destruction and forcing you to take decisions extremely fast forcing you to take decisions which are based on uh, uh data that is uh, uh, interpreted by machines and perhaps 
making you liable to make mistakes without your own without your own knowledge and that risk is there even within the framework of narrow artificial intelligence we don't have to worry about ai being being right. uh, super intelligent and and uh, self intuitive and all that i mean that may happen that may not happen uh, the jury is that it could possibly happen but we don't have to wait for that that right. day right according to the council on foreign relations global conflict uh, tracker there are currently 27 conflicts of varying size going on in the world with affecting some 2 billion people living in, in those situations for instance in yemen where there is a continuing war between the saudi backed government forces and iran backed houthis the situation is so bad that there have been cases of children having to eat their own fingers out of absolute starvation with a situation like that uh, what do you expect uh, will happen in the next 10 15 20 you, you've already laid out a pretty grim scenario but when you come down to the specifics like the one that i just cited it's quite quite extraordinary mind there are conflicts and there are conflicts in the last few minutes i have been talking about a globally devastating wars which could uh, put an end to human race but that is one kind of conflict and that's the most deadly because because that will finish the project of human civilization which has been going on for last 12000 years and it will put an end to the our species uh, the homo sapiens uh, who have been around for 200000 years but even short of that there are there are other wars like the one in yemen like the one in syria uh, like the one in ethiopia the right. ethiopia has been moving from transboundary conflicts to uh, domestic conflicts uh, again to transboundary conflicts uh, back and forth so these wars are bad enough and what we are seeing already already even at this stage if you look at yemen and 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 if you look at the kind of situation that to describe and also what has been happening in syria and in libya don't forget libya uh, as well we may not have yet reached a point where we are witnessing the likely death of human civilization that could that could happen in 10 20 30 years but we have already reached a point in some spots of the world in some parts of the world where we are witnessing the death of humanity so True. what we are seeing yeah. in yemen what we are seeing in libya it's not the death of the entire civilization but is definitely death of humanity right and i always like to remember what russell and einstein said in 1955 remember your humanity forget the rest right and we are forgetting our humanity and remembering everything else <laughs> you know early on in your book uh, you write about uh, russia in 2019 inducting hypersonic avantgarde uh, missiles that travel 27 times the speed of sound and they carry a nuclear payload uh, to which which to you signal the sort of possible preparation for a world war why do you say that well in fact i mentioned this incident in my preface right. even before i start uh, writing my first chapter so my what happened in june 2019 uh, just to explain to you a bit of a background of why i wrote this book uh, i was in normandy mm-hmm. with a, a group of philosophers thinkers uh, peacemakers and there were six of us including four nobel laureates uh, mohammad el bardai jody williams dennis mukwege lema gobi and philosopher anthony grayling and myself and we issued normandy manifesto for world peace but we negotiated the text of this manifesto over about 6 to 7 months prior to june 19 uh, by email by personal meetings telephone calls and in the course of drafting the normandy manifesto for world peace we realized that the risk of uh, survival of uh, the risk to survival of of uh, human civilization was real and it was near it wasn't something imaginary do it's not something that people think about every day people are worried about lot of other things and much smaller wars and when i uh, was in normandy and we issued this normandy manifesto what is my friend suggested that i should really 
uh, expand some of this thinking and write a longer essay or a book. And that is when the seeds of thought about the book were sown. But then I was uh, uh, kind of slipping over it and I didn't really do much. I had some research taking place with the help of two able uh, uh, research assistants uh, in, in my organization. But what really hit me was around Christmas 2019, Russia inducted avant-garde in their uh, military service. And this is a hypersonic missile, which other than the fact that it has 27 times the speed of sound, the fact that it carries uh, 2000 kiloton nuclear payload, what is most striking that it determines its own trajectory and exactly. it cannot be detected by a radar. So basically with the induction of this uh, nuclear capable uh, uh, autonomous missile, the Russians are preparing for a, for, for a, some kind of a situation uh, where they might how to use this missile. Uh, and uh, considering the range of this missile, I thought, well, I mean, you are looking at a global stage. You are not looking at just Ukraine or somewhere right. nearby. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, with the kind of uh, capabilities this uh, uh, missile has of self-determination of its own pathways, uh, you are really entered an era where the Russians are giving up, handing over the control of, of, uh, over these kinds of missiles. Uh, to algorithm and that really stunned me and i thought look you know there is something happening here and then three months later in march as you would expect the americans tested their hypersonic yeah. missile and few months later the chinese sent a hypersonic missile which in fact went around the earth right. and even the indians uh, uh, had a small hypersonic missile tested so the race for hypersonic missile started and with hypersonic missile, there is a, just like there was a qualitative change in the arms race when nuclear weapons were introduced in 1945, there is another qualitative change when hypersonic missiles are introduced now with uh, in 2019, 2020, 2021, because now uh, you have these missiles which uh, uh, which don't care for radars and no radar can detect them, and and you can literally have a war on its own, almost an autonomous war. So right. that really alarmed me, and so I wanted to see. A little bit in depth i wanted to explore as to what was really the nature of danger and what were the other threats and what were the other technological developments which uh, you know, were of uh, issues of concern beyond the hypersonic missiles right yeah. Uh, yeah. and and that is how i started writing about the book you you also write about uh, the doomsday clock which was set up in 1947 by the bulletin of atomic scientists being set at its closest in January 2022, this year, at 100 seconds to midnight. Uh, tell me a bit more about that, why that happened and uh, what that for, for foreshadows. Well, the Bulletin of uh, Atomic Scientists, which was founded by Albert Einstein right. and many scientists who worked on the Project Manhattan, uh, so who were involved, in fact, in making the, making the bombs, uh, uh, who felt disgusted with what they were doing, and then they formed this uh, bulletin. Uh, for now, 75 years, they have created this tool of doomsday clock, which is in fact in your city, in Chicago. I know. Sure, I'm and, aware of it. And, yes. and, and, and the doomsday clock uh, is a metaphor. I mean, it's a real clock, but, but its hands are a metaphor. So when the doomsday clock uh, touches 12 midnight, it's the end of human civilization. It's your final crisis from which there is no recovery. And the, there is a scientific board which every year meets and decides where should where the hands of doomsday clock should be. Right. So many years ago, the hands were 14 minutes away, 15 minutes away from midnight, which was a relative comfort, uh, uh, comfortable position. Right. But in the last five years, the hands have moved closer and closer to midnight. And in last three years, they have been steady at uh, 100 seconds to midnight and i won't be surprised they 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 said these hands in january in the last week of january if in january 2023 they said the hands to one minute to midnight in fact if i were part of the scientific board uh, i would set the uh, hands at uh, uh, one minute to midnight so That's what nice. these hands indicate is a collective wisdom of some of the greatest scientists in the world 
a vast majority of them nobel laureates a vast majority of them physicists so who understand what they are talking about these are not peace nicks these are not peace activists uh, these are very serious highly respected scientists uh, physicists and others uh, in their opinion what is the risk to the survival of human civilization that is what the hands represent and for last 3 years the hands have been dangerously close uh, to midnight at 100 seconds which has never happened before in the 75 years of history of doomsday clock right one of your chapters uh, talks about a war resulting from national ego a sort of martial nationalism as it were where do you think uh, such danger emanates the most from my my argument is that nationalism is playing a very important role in uh, mobilizing uh, masses elite and opinion in general in favor of hawkish policies some of which would result in a in support for a war right uh, uh, anywhere in the world uh, not only a global nuclear war but even wars between the uh but countries in different troubled regions of the world so i am not suggesting that nationalism alone would drive a war but nationalism can play a very important role in mobilizing public sentiment and 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 even the political will of rulers until 17th century in most parts of the world particularly in europe and the middle east religion was the driving force people got rulers got excited by by religion and uh, they fought wars of religion and that is what uh, you know, mostly happened finally you had this 30 year war of religion from 1618 to 1648 which resulted in the peace of westphalia right. since then slowly religion is being replaced by nationalism or sometimes even by a combination of religion and nationalism or what you might call religious nationalism and nationalism is is now providing a new alibi and also a new raison d'etre a new uh, driving force for those who want to wage war we discussed earlier that wars can be launched by anybody who want to launch them since it's a matter of choice somebody who makes a makes a decision in favor of a war and then they look for a excuse uh, they look for a, a reason Sometimes they don't they even do that. that nationalism. Right? Now I'm saying sometimes they don't even give you a justification. Sometimes they don't even give you a justification. That's true. But uh, somewhere down the line, I think in most wars they 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 like to provide a, a justification maybe a little bit later, not yeah. exactly when they when they launch the war, but maybe a little later. And and nationalism. So nationalism works both ways. It can also be a justification to their own people. and nationalism is also the driving force so first the sentiment of hypernationalism uh, uh, produces a war and then they use this nationalism to justify war in the eyes of their uh, their population right uh, can you blame uh, national egos to uh, for coming into play when an action like say for instance what china uh, did with the indian territory some time ago or there are examples of completely gratuitous uh, encroachment or invasion what if uh, rather a subtle invasion if you if you can call it that when that happens uh, do you think national egos can be blamed for responding to it well when you are attacked uh, i believe every sovereign state has a right to defend and to manage his borders and to manage his national interest so if china attacks india which they have done in the border region in recent years we are not looking at the history and we are not looking at 1962 war and 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 some of the other historical transgressions but even if you look at the recent past and the chinese violation of the the line of control uh, between uh, china or line of actual control between between china and india uh, uh, india has every reason to try to defend its uh, position and i think that is uh, 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 expected uh, that would be expected uh, in any country if russia is attacking ukraine and ukraine has every reason and justification to defend this territory so if you are attacked 
uh, if you are invaded in whatever form and to whatever uh, extent, uh, you have to defend uh, the, your territory. That's not so much about nationalism. I mean, nationalism plus play a subtle role, but it's just a question of uh, the principle of natural justice that uh, you don't want to be invaded, you don't want to be subjugated, and you don't want to live under the occupation or you don't want your people to live under the occupation of other country. This right. is why Normandy landings took place. I mean, because Germany had occupied France, uh, the, the allied countries thought that uh, there was a, a full justification in uh, landing in Normandy, in France, and uh, uh, countering the German occupation and vacating it. Right. Uh, so uh, there is a philosopher in, uh, in New York, uh, Lou Marinoff, uh, who has written a very uh, interesting book on human conflict. Hmm. And uh, uh, he has also studied war and, and conflict uh, uh, going back over thousands of years. And, and Professor Marinov says something interesting. He says the only thing that is as bad as war is, is, is invasion. I mean, is being invaded, is, subjugate, is being subjugated to an invasion, is occupation. Right. You don't want to live under occupation. Yeah. So uh, in the oh. case of the conflict between uh, China and India, what the Chinese tried to do, at least the way I look at it from, from here, from Mumbai, is that they try to occupy an Indian uh, territory or a territory which was uh, 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 on our side of the uh, line of actual control. And so India was, uh, uh, you know, justified in vacating that occupation or at least intending to vacate that occupation right. to whatever extent you succeed in that. So I wouldn't really say that that's the case of hypernationalism. I think hypernationalism mostly plays when you are attacking or when you are in invading. So maybe on the Chinese side, it was a case of nationalism, of asserting its national ego, its, uh, its, uh, its uh, 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 a position, uh, uh, newfound position in the world and um, making a, uh, and, and giving a signal. Right. Uh, but when you are defending a territory, uh, it has a different uh, explanation. I want to end on a somewhat upbeat, uh, uh, forward-looking note uh, taken from your own uh, suggestion of having a new social contract, sort of have a United Nations 3.0, if you will. Um, tell me a bit about that and what role you think India can play within that new social contract. My could remember, Rousseau wrote social contract in 1762. Right. And at that time, you still had an ensure regime. It was before the French Revolution. And Rousseau was, uh, you know, he spent most of his life in Geneva, which was the city state. So his idea of social contract really looked at the relationship between the state and the society within the boundaries of a nation. Whatever that nation may be, it could be a city-state or it could be a larger French uh, Republic post-revolution, um, whatever. But it was all within the boundaries of a, of a country. And it worked well in 18th century, in 19th century, maybe even part of the 20th century, that you could have a social contract as defined as a, uh, as a relationship between the state and the society within a country. But in the last few decades, as we approached 21st century, and now that we are in the 21st century, uh, the uh, borders are becoming more and more irrelevant, uh, not in every sense, but on many dimensions. You have COVID, which spreads from uh, one continent to another to uh, affect almost all 200 countries and territories in the world in a matter of few weeks. You have... Uh, 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 greenhouse gases, which go from one continent to another in a matter of few hours or a few days, as it happened with uh, you know, forest fires in Australia and the gases going on to Latin America. Uh, if you have a nuclear war, even in, on a limited scale in any one part of the world, again, the radiation will spread uh, across, across the yeah. world. So there are now factors which are no longer within the confines of a nation. And therefore, you need a new global social contract which underlines a relationship between the society, the state, and the world, or the global, uh, the, the human civilization at large. 
so that is my proposal we have to start thinking in terms of a of a global social contract where you are looking at the relationship between the individual in the society or the society not only with the state in your own country of course that's your primary uh, relationship so long as there is a system of nation state but but we should also make a beginning uh, to start looking at at the same time a relationship with human civilization with the human society with the global society uh, and then this will have to be converted into an institutional architecture right which would mean we will have to reinvent the united nations and i have studied how the multilateral in uh, the ideas of multilateral institutions have evolved in fact the first person to think of a multilateral organization was poet dante in 13th century so united nations uh, was really uh, 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 a result of almost 6th or 7th centuries of uh, thought processes yeah. emeric crusade in 1623 uh, for the first time uh, laid down a real architecture for something like the united nations he didn't call it the united nation immanuel kant proposed uh, perpetual peace and a confederation of states and what is not known to lot of people mahatma gandhi also proposed uh, a peaceful confederation of states right uh, so we have to look at some of these ideas which have been proposed over 700 years some of them have worked some of them have not worked league of nations didn't work united nations has uh, partly worked but what we call united nations is really a united governments organization right the ambassadors uh, you know, who are representing the states uh, in the un uh, they very much represent national interests they don't represent the global interests or the interests of humanity and the un has been reduced to a bargaining forum to negotiate the interest of different nation states and if we go on this path then we will we will really end up into a catastrophe a catastrophe <coughs> one expression of which could be a global nuclear war and the end of civil civilization but if we want to go on another path uh, which is quite possible then we have to have a new philosophy which looks at a, the possibility of a global civil social contract in a relationship with not only your state not only with your nation but also with the human society at large and that has to be reflected in the new architecture of multi, uh, multilateral organizations and a, and a complete overhaul of the united nations looking at the ideas of emeric crusade looking at the ideas of mahatma gandhi looking at the ideas of even albert einstein and if we seriously apply ourselves to some of these ideas and there is a slow awakening which is uh, uh, taking place daisaku ikeda the great buddhist leader is proposing uh, a parliament of humanity there are many scholars for proposing a world parliamentary assembly so there are many ideas which are coming but the mainstream media doesn't look at these ideas yeah. but if we if we harness these ideas and if we build on them uh, i'm sure we will be able to build a, uh, build a new architecture of global uh, uh, security uh, which is uh, universal which is non discriminatory which is fair which is sustainable and which is uh, based on partnership rather than partisanship